Welcome everyone to the Adversity to Advantage podcast. Uh, I'm very excited today. We have got Jen Koken. Um, we've been talking for ages. We've never met, but we've been talking for ages. I know you're, you're an author, you're a coach and a speaker. You do so many things. And I know that your story very much um, sort of parallels mine in the adversity that you've faced and the things that you've learned. And our warm up chat has already gotten me very excited about the things we can uh, learn from you. Welcome to the show. Well, thank you so much, Patra, for having me. And more importantly, thanks for having the show. It's, you know, well, it's, oh, I was just going to say that because I think, I think people, when they're facing adversity, think nobody else can relate. And that's so not true. Absolutely. Because I, re I remember being in my own rock bottom moments. And what we tend to do is isolate, which is ironic, given that there's isolation going on all over the world that's enforced, right? So I'm actually... I know you're putting content out at the moment just to help lift people's spirits and to help them um, uh, you sort of feel supported and connected during this, this time. But um, yeah, we think we're the only ones when we're in it. We think no one will understand. We have some kind of unique formula of pain that nobody will get. And what we tend to do is shut down. Um, and so I know that there's so many aspects to your story, but before we go into it, just fill in the blanks for our, for our audience. What are the things that you do? What, what are you passionate about at the moment? Oh, man, I'm passionate about lifting other people up as much as I can. I was sharing that, you know, this has forced me to do some things that I've been resisting, you know, like get my YouTube channel up and running and learn how to edit videos. So every day from 9 a.m. Uh, East Coast time in the States to 9, 10. So I don't know what time that is in where you're at that's uh what like noon or something or, I, or so. some, some, yeah, yeah. I go live on Facebook for at least 10 minutes with whatever I ask people to write in and say what do you want me to talk about so today I talked about uncertainty and how to deal with uncertainty and that's going up on my YouTube channel so that's number one number two is I said that this morning like I'm so tired of people arguing about whose fault it is that we're at the state we're in and it so much reminds me of that Dr. Seuss book the butter battle book where for centuries the two villages were warring about which side of the bread to butter. Right. Like just put just the saying. effing butter down and eat together. Eat like just yeah. stop it. Stop it. We can go back to politics, at least here in the States. I feel like we can go back to the politics when it's all over. Let's take care of each other. Um, and then you asked me another question about a little bit more about me and my, my background. Yeah. So I'm an, an ex, I, I call myself the executive coach to badass boss ladies, nice. um, you know, women who are super, uh, accomplished, but are, have lost their mojo or lost their way and are tired of feeling uncertain and really don't have that confidant to talk to because they're at that stage in the game where they, if they say something, they, it may come back to them. Um, and then they usually call me the velvet sledgehammer because I deliver, news and I, I try to be really loving no, but I i'm very it. direct we're like soul very. sisters that's my reputation as well um, i love I, it and i don't only work with women i work with um exec men as well i do i mostly work in uh, mental health and advising organizations on uh, their strategy and all of that but i think we sometimes skirt around things a lot these days in this world of like nobody gets a trophy and you know let's make sure everyone feels loved and okay and actually people at the top are like I don't want to be surrounded by a yes person. I want some, some angle. I want somebody to see me and like provoke my self-awareness. So it sounds like you do some of that as well, which I love. Yes, yes, we are definitely soul sisters. Yeah, I mean, if, if we, as the people who are, are coaching these folks, aren't going to say to them, you're full of crap, somebody has <laughs> got to say to you, you're full of crap. And don't get me started on everybody gets a trophy. Everybody should not get a trophy have the experience of winning and have the experience of losing and understand and go back and, and watch the game tapes. I mean, you're six, you're playing soccer. You're not going to have a game. tape. Well, somebody would on their phone and learn from it. That's that. the, yeah, that's the whole thing about adversity. We have to find the learning in it, you know, yeah. the silver lining. And getting away from the, the beating ourselves up bit, which is often what happens. And you're a speaker as well. And I find at the beginning of my speaking career, I found it really difficult to watch video back. I'd be like, what am I doing with my hand? What, where am I looking? What the hell am I doing? Yeah, yeah. What's my face that, doing? I, like, yeah. I thought that line was really funny and it's just dead, you know, um, and needing to just face up, watch, learn, iterate, those sorts of things, right? Um, yeah. Have you found that in speaking too? 
Well, you know, so I don't know if you've heard of something called uh, Landmark Worldwide or the Landmark Forum. Yeah. Having been, so I was one of their program leaders for 16 years, and all I ever did was watch tape of me with my coach. I had to watch it by myself with them, wow. uh, cri- you know, critiquing, just giving feedback, getting better at delivering material, but also how I interacted with people. So it, it really had me hone in on starting fast, getting connected with people, and then going deep. And you know this, being able to hear what people are saying. And I'm a stand-up comedian, so I videotape myself and I watch. I go, oh, oh. wow, that so wasn't funny. Or or you, you, I will beat myself up after the show because, you know, your brain, 80% of your thoughts are negative. So I'm mulling over everything I did wrong. And I go back and look and think to myself, wow, you got a lot of laughs. That was funny. You should use that again kind of thing. So I think it goes both ways, you know? Absolutely. Because it can also be when we do something vulnerable or put ourselves out there in some way, right? Like Brené Brown stuff of sometimes you just got to do it afraid, but the vulnerability hangover and, you know, so our brain might be going into insecure mode, but actually we delivered connection and somebody got something out of it, right? And it's it's sometimes tricky self-awareness to know which is which. Yeah, absolutely. That vulnerability hangover, it's real. It is real. It it really really is real, you know, and I, I have and I'm sure you've done this too, where you've shared something either through this podcast or through a radio show or when you're speaking and afterwards you're thinking to yourself, oh, I, I shouldn't have opened the kimono that far. Yes. And all you want is someone to tell you you did okay. And then someone says that and then you think to yourself, they don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. They have no it's, idea. Yeah. yeah, it's such a sand. It's like layers of a cake or a sandwich. <sighs> Yeah. yeah, but then what I love about you is you're, you you just keep showing up, and I think that's the edge that some of us have over uh, other people. It's not that we don't have the thoughts; it's just that we keep showing up uh, anyway. Or, or, and and we'll go into this, but um, I actually think my drive and ambition is very much directly correlated to the amount of adversity and the amount of self destructive behaviors I also have the capacity for. So I'm, I'm 13 years sober. Uh, I was raised in a religious cult, um, you know, spiraled into suicidal uh, depression, uh, the, all those sorts of things, right? And I think my capacity was so intense to like hurt myself because of shame and all of that, that actually once I learned to switch it, I realized that I had just as much capacity or, or energy when focused to do good in the world, to, to, to learn, to create impact, um, which is why I actually have great gratitude for, for some of that capacity over there. Yeah, well, I think, I think too, what you're speaking to is you have great courage to go, to take chances, to go deep because you had the, yes, you had the, you had the rebellious or the whatever, you know, the self-destructive yeah. behaviors. It's so funny. I was telling a friend, I, well, I sent my stepmom a picture of an empty cake box on Saturday because I was my third time in two weeks or so going out to the store. And, you know, I'm buying stuff I don't normally buy. I'm like, well, that, those pork rinds look delicious, right? I should eat. So I got this gluten-free cake. It was small. It was like a personal pancake. And I brought it home and I thought, well, there's like four slices. So, you know, I'll eat slices and I'll just sort of eat it. It was gone in one day. And I took a photograph of it and I wrote, bought this, ate it yesterday. Felt like a week. Hashtag COVID-19 time. (laughs) And I sent it to my stepmom and she thought it was a meme that I found on the internet. And I was like, no, that was me. It was my She's like, oh, I, it happens to the best of us. You know, it happens to the best of us. Oh, I do think there's some comfort eating gone mad, isn't there? Just there like, is. it's just being indoors and trying to find anything that will give us a sense of relief from the relentless, like negative energy that's everywhere. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I like, I drank an entire bottle of wine on Sunday, which is, I usually have a glass, you know, and oh, yeah. I thought when I woke up the next day and I didn't feel like physically hungover, but mentally I was cloudy and I thought, okay, you're numbing and you are exactly. using this as a way to not deal with your emotions and, and to numb out and zone out. Don't. And like, not right, sit well, with, yeah, the, the feelings. And, and that's a really good point that I imagine many, many, many people are doing at the moment. Um, so I want to dive into your story because I know that you've learned, we're already like soul sistering and just going, and what about this? And what about this? Um, but I want people to get context. They know a bit of my story already uh, to just get that sense of, you know, where life took you and how it is that you, you've learned and, and you're able to, in a way, capitalize on it now. 
Um, I know you, you wrote a book and there was a, a period of your life where so many things were happening at once. But before we go there, I'm just curious about what was it like growing up? Like, like did you, uh, were you taught resilience through your childhood, do you think? Do you think you had edge then? Or was it actually like you just lived a normal childhood and had to figure it out later? I, that's a really good question. I, I sort of compartmentalized my childhood. So I was born in, well, I was born in New Jersey, but raised in Michigan in Kalamazoo. And I was there from like two to nine, let's say. Very idyllic is how I remember it, you know, getting up in the morning and putting, you know, at six years old, getting on my bike and following the high school band that when the summers that was marching to practice and going to my grade school and going to synagogue and going to Sunday school. And then we moved to Ohio. And that for me was very much like a, a very, um, I don't know if it's this way for you, when memories I can tell are still impacting me, they're in technicolor. And once I process them, they go to black and white and sort of fade into this tapestry of my life. But I know there's a very much a dividing line between Ohio and Michigan because I went from this very middle class, you know, kind of small town to a much more affluent suburb that was completely Jewish for the most part with kids who had a lot of money. And I was not used to that. And so, and I remember being myself and being happy with myself. And then the kids are smoking and they're shaving their legs and forcing myself to grow up and be like them, but they were, they were also very hard-nosed in a way and cavalier, um, just kind of nothing. They were cool. They were cool, like nothing bothered them. When I was a very sensitive kid with a big heart, and I think that, I don't, I don't know if it was resilience. It was more, I became a chameleon trying to fit in Ooh. and not being in touch with, not being grounded and confident in who I was to just fit in with myself. You know, if I had to go back and talk to my 10, 11 year old self, I would say, you're enough. You're, you're great. You're, you're kind, you're loving. So what if you're the teacher's pet? So what if you love to study and learn, keep down that track? Because at that moment when I kind of, you know, that switch, switch flipped, right? Flip, yeah, switch, yeah. the yeah, switch yeah. flipped. <laughs> The switch flipped, yeah. The switch flipped. Like that's when my parents started arguing. We had another move. My parents got divorced. I got rebellious. I started acting out and I robbed a house while high on pot when I was 15 and got busted and was on probation. Good. You know, and so I went from, so that's, it's a very, was that resilient? No, not at all. I think it was trying to fit in, trying to conform, um, you know, just trying to figure out my teenage years. And I was actually reflecting on this last night, thinking how much I missed out for myself on high school and participating because I was still trying to be cool and fit in, but at the same time was angry. That's why I was rebellious. But I had a moment when I was 15 where I took this course and recognized that I didn't need to be a juvenile delinquent. I didn't need to hang out with the wrong kids. I could actually make a difference with my life. And when I was 16, that was the first congressional race that I worked on. And then went on to a career in politics for about 25 years. And, you know, my life really became about making a difference. So I think it was that moment at 15 or 16 when I realized I had a voice and a say about how life was going to go. And so then it became, I think, teaching myself resilience and learning a lot and falling down and getting back well, up. And I guess and that's, up. that's how we learn resilience. So you're in this place where you're trying to fit in. I really relate to the chameleon side of things where it's just like, just like me, love me. Let me be what you need me to be, right? Um, which yep. is a really hard habit to let go of, actually, uh, yep. because you can be liked and you can have pseudo love and, you know, all these sorts of things. And then uh, it's, it's later that you can kind of, it can give you a bit of a different complex where you think, well, people love me, but not necessarily for me, just for the role that I'm playing. Yep, um, yep. And so you go into politics. So tell me, like, why? How? Like, did you have political influences? Did somebody just meet you? And I don't know, who, did someone mentor you? What happened? Well, uh, let's see. First, first of all, I wanted to be an actor. And my mother made this side comment to me one day. And she goes, you know, that's really hard. You're going to have to wait tables. And I went, oh, I don't know, maybe I don't want to work that hard. So I went into politics instead. I always <laughs> laugh about that. No, what happened was, so I went, I started college when I was 16. Okay. I graduated high school when I was 16. I was young, you know, my birthday is in August. So I started a year and then I skipped a grade. And I was going to wait a year to go to college and I was going to apply to acting schools. And friends of mine were going. And my best friend 
was getting ready to go to college and she asked me to go with her to visit the campus. And then she began putting this thought in my head, wouldn't it be fun if we were here together? And I thought, yes. So I started at college and my very first semester, I took American national government and my professor was so inspiring and was talking about how we can all make a difference and we really have a, a commitment to our community and to the world to make that difference. And he had just started a master's degree program in political campaign management. And I'm friends with him to this day. He's now probably in his 80s. And every once in a while I drive to Ohio and bring my bike and we go on a bike ride together. But he was so inspiring. That's why I launched into my career in politics because I wanted to make a difference. Isn't it incredible how one person can have that amount of, of impact in our lives? Um, so, so you go into politics and you find, you build loads of resilience because you fail, you keep going, you, you keep testing things, right? And I guess that's how resilience is built, right? It's yep. messing up, falling apart and continuing to show up. Um, and so where did that lead you? Did you feel like uh, life was fulfilling at that time? Did it feel like it was all just smooth ahead of you? Oh, smooth ahead of me. No, I, I don't, I don't think I much ever thought about, I never had like a three year or a five year or a 10 year plan. Okay. And maybe that was my training in politics. Like you're working on a campaign, you get to the end of it. What's the next campaign? I learned a lot through that time. Life was really fulfilling. I worked in New Jersey on a variety of state based environmental laws. Uh, I worked at the national level on ending poverty and impacting hunger uh, here in Washington, DC and in Boston. Um, I then went on to open my own consulting firm and was teaching nonprofits how to raise money, but really only worked with organizations that uh, trained young people to be leaders, because that's always been my passion to see young people step into their leadership. Um, and then fast forward to right around 2004, I met and fell in love with a park ranger. And he lived in Colorado and I lived in Ohio. And life was great. I was very satisfied. I had a lot of friends, but there was this moment of, wow, am I going to, am I going to wonder what if, mm. you know, what if I don't, cause I knew Rick was never going to move east of the Mississippi. And I had just been laid off of my job because that's the nature of campaigns. They end or nonprofits, you get laid off, they run out of sure. money. Yeah. And I sold everything and moved to Colorado, lock, stock and barrel to go be with him. Wow. And then broke up with him three months after I got there. <gasps> That's a quick turnaround. Okay, well, that could lead to several rock bottoms, couldn't it? Um, it could. Yeah, so wh how soon did you know that it wasn't right? So you obviously were excited and got, got swept up in it, and then how soon did you actually know, do you think? Well, my, my friends here were very smart and made sure I wasn't going for him, but was going for me, because I really did some self-reflection and recognized that while I was happy where I was at with my life, I was also very complacent. And I talk about this in my book. I think where we build resilience is where, when we're playing on the skinny branches without a net, when we take chances, when we don't know if we're going to succeed. Yep. Because then, like you said, you fail, you get up, and you keep showing up. Yeah. So I told Rick flat out, this was not about him. This was about me because he was very, like, he didn't want to be responsible. What if things didn't work out? Sure. But when I got there, um, it was very obvious to me that he either was never going to commit to me or was never going to commit to anybody. And I really wanted to be, I wanted to get married and I wanted to have kids and I wanted to do that kind of, you know, sort of the traditional, which is really funny in hindsight, traditional lifestyle. Um, and so I told him it wasn't going to work. And then about a year later, I met my ex-husband and he had kids from a previous relationship. So I felt like, okay, you know, I got to get married, have kids. And then we split up after three years. Interesting, the power of threes. Oh, yeah, I hadn't thought about that. Well, Three I only say that because the way I was raised was that the, apparently the end of the world was coming every three years as I grew up. Because we were oh. in a religious kind of, yeah, so it was like every th three years, the world was going to end. So we always had this like internal unconscious marker point that everything would end. And I, it's, I swear, my friends, like for me, it was after I, um, I was with my ex-husband for 13 years. Uh, I would then date in a cycle of three months, three months, three months, three months, three months. And my friends would swear that they'd be in relationships and after three years, they would consistently end. It would consistently end. And for us, we've been like trying to work it out and thinking, oh, maybe it was because we always, we wouldn't even go do a degree when we left the, the religious movement because we were like, I mean, I have one now, but it took a fuckload of concentration to go, let me sign up for something that's going to take that long, you know? <laughs> 
Um, <laughs> so anyway, I don't know. That's I was just like totally projecting, thinking, oh, I wonder what the threes is about. No, it's interesting because like even with my jobs, every one of them was probably so uh, three years. I had my company for four or five years, that like four years. But it's a lot of it is cycles of three. And then someone said to me, well, the one consistent thing was my the training and development and the programs I was leading for Landmark, which was 16, 18 years. And they're really right about that because it was the most fulfilling years, which is why I became a coach okay. uh, full time because it was the most fulfilling thing. And I love that you dropped the F bomb. Thank you. Yes, that's why you that here. No, I love it because I tell people if you can't handle me saying fuck every once in a while, I, you shouldn't, I shouldn't be your coach. Get over it. Yeah, like you yeah. can't be that like, you know, proper. Oh. Yeah, no, you hire you to help like shake things up, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's essentially the purpose. Um, so I know you've written a book, and your 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 book is, is sort of off the back of some pretty intense stuff that's happened for you. So tell yeah. us what's the book called, what's it about, and and let's just go. You know, what were some of your own rock bottom moments that led to that? Yeah, so the book is called When I Die, Take My Panties. Love it. Turn, <laughs> turning. I, mean, I just want to buy it for that title to be on my bookshelf. <laughs> Somebody hired me flat out. I slide unseen for that title because she was like, she's got to be great. <laughs> so it's when I die, take my panties, turning your darkest moments into your greatest gifts. And it really is meant to inspire people to live their best life now and understand you cannot control things. You cannot control people. You cannot control situations. And the more you do, the more you're in the shitter. And you've really just got to be with people just the way they are and yourself and, and cut yourself some slack. Um, so that just so relevant for these times, right? When you're talking yes. about control and so much of the fear during COVID-19 globally pandemics um, is people thinking, uh, ah, nothing's in my control, right? So their anxiety raises, fight flight responses, and it's imp it feels really impossible for some people to just do that, enjoy the moment, yeah. look for the opportunity, shift the perspective. Um, so it's so, so very apt uh, for people to find the book. So what inspired it for you? Well, so my mom was diagnosed with ovarian cancer in 2006 after being misdiagnosed for a year, and they found it by accident. Wow. That was a turning point moment. Now, I know it's a lot of these things I talk about in the book of just my world being upended because my mom for me was kind of, you know, my mom dying, what? You know, sort of like Santa Claus, it's not, he's not real, what? You know, just upended my life. And so we were very blessed that she lived over five years, which statistically was not probable when she was diagnosed it was stage four um oh, wow yeah usually people have less than a 30 percent chance of living five years and to say this that she was misdiagnosed they diagnosed her with irritable bowel syndrome candida all these different things because the symptoms of ovarian cancer mirror a woman's monthly cycle so I'm just going to say them real quick so people understand Please. it because yeah. everybody either who's watching this or listening either is a woman or knows a woman Sure, sure, sure. As far as I can tell, right? Unless you're a test tube baby, but you still got your egg from somebody and that person was female. I'm yeah. just saying. Yeah. Okay. So if you remember the acronym BEAT, like you beat a drum, okay. B for bloating, E for eating, A for abdominal, and T for trouble. So B, bloating. So, and if you have all four of these symptoms at the same time and no change in diet or exercise, um, lessens them, get to your gynecologist and say, prove to me I don't have it. And the only way they can prove that is if they take a biopsy of tissue, because there's no test, there's no way to know if you have ovarian cancer. So bloating, eating, you feel full quickly or your appetite is lessened, abdominal pain, trouble urinating, your bladder feels full, you can't go, or you're going all the time and only a little bit is coming out. So that's just my, my public service announcement yeah. on the side. Yeah, yeah. Um, so mom was diagnosed, she lived five years, and when she, like the last month of her life, uh, I was with her and she kind of, I had taken her to see some friends to have some lunch and she sort of sighed and she looked at me and she said, you know, she's trying to buckle her seatbelt over this big tumor. She looked like she was nine months pregnant. She said, she sighed and she goes, I've had a beautiful life. Um, I hope I have a beautiful death. And I was like, huh. And after that, and that's also where the book title came in because she was showing me that last week that we were together. Um, she was showing me the things in her home that she wanted me to have. Here's this jacket. Here's this piece of jewelry. And then she opens up this drawer and she says, you know, look, Goodwill won't take these. You can't throw them away. Please take my panties. And they're hanky-pankies, which are the most comfortable thong underwear. 
in the world. And now you have my mother's seven-year-old ass in yes. long underwear. Yes, you we can't do. And see that. No. You're welcome. You're <laughs> Thank welcome. you. We all need You're distractions welcome. and escapism these days. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So, but when I got home, you know, I went to church that Sunday because I would often go to this unity church and I went to go get some breakfast afterwards and I wrote the first chapter. And I called my mom and I said, look, we got to tell your story. Because so you, know you wrote the chapter before she passed. Before so she you passed. started the book before you were, okay, in the lead yep. up. Interesting. Yep. Yep. I wrote that first chapter and I um, said to her, I don't want any other woman to be mis misdiagnosed in this way. I don't want any other family to go through what we went through. And if we can save one life, then the life that you've had, mom, as a, she worked for NASA, she was a school teacher, which her life made such a big difference, then your death will make as big of a difference as your life. So yes, I wrote that first chapter, but then there was a whole other year. I mean, then there was her going through hospice. And then, um, you know, once she went through hospice and she passed away, I had been looking for, I was living in Colorado. I had been looking for a new job. I was recruited to move to DC to work with a company I moved, I had knee surgery, I moved, I went from the mountains of Colorado in a 1500 square foot home to a 350 square foot uh, studio in the middle of the city and working 90 hours a week at a job I really didn't know what I was doing. And four months later, found myself on a street corner after being told that I needed to resign with my laptop and my phone in hand with no place to live and no place to go. So what a domino effect. Big um, time. Yeah, and before I go into where that sort of leaves you, I'm curious about before your mom passed, you write that chapter. Did you immediately let her read it? Did she, like, did you, did you show it to her? What were her thoughts around you creating something of a legacy? I didn't read it to her because it was, I wasn't exactly sure, you know, where I was going with it. And I also, at that time, it was one of my last stand-up performances in Colorado. She did help me co-write some jokes about her cancer. <laughs> um, yeah, because, you know, as a comedian, what I talk about is what's going on with me from an authentic perspective, right? Because you're a storyteller. And I called my, my mentor, my comedic mentor, and we were going to be, we we're doing a show together as my last hurrah before I moved. Um, or actually, we didn't know that I was moving. It was just a show because I moved a couple months later. Now that I think about it, anyhow, I said to Christina, I said, I, I don't know what to write about. And what do you mean? Well, because everything that's going on with me right now is my mom and her cancer and taking care of her. Well, why don't you write about that? I, Christina, what if other people are dealing with that? I don't want to make them sad. I don't want to offend them. And she said, Jennifer, cancer's fucking offensive. Offend people. And I went, oh, mm -hmm. Okay. So I wrote some material. I mm -hmm. called my mom. I shared it with her. She didn't laugh. She didn't think it was funny. She called me back the next day and she goes, that wasn't funny, but here I wrote some stuff for you. Here's what is funny. And then she proceeded to give me a couple of jokes that I use. She goes, here's what's funny, Jen. I went to St. Armand Circle, which is this very posh place in Sarasota, Florida. And I bought all these clothes, like thousands of dollars worth and I kept the tags on because I'm thinking to myself, why would I wear them? I'm going to be dying soon. You should return them and get the money. She goes, fuck you. I cut the tags. I'm wearing them. There goes your inheritance. <laughs> <laughs> oh, she could see the funny side even then. Yeah. Yeah. Well, she was an actor too. So I came by it naturally. She and my dad both did community theater for years and she was a great, great, great actor. Well, and I'm hearing gifts already that she passed on to you, but what do you think was her greatest influence on you? You know, it's so funny when I look back at her life, the greatest gift was her dying mm. because I learned to appreciate so much about her that I had never appreciated. For example, I felt like she was always living her life in service of others and she didn't have a bucket list and she didn't really go for like, why didn't she continue to act after she met my stepdad? Well, he wanted her at home. Why didn't she go off and do, you know, go to Europe again like she did when she divorced my dad because she wanted to take trips with the family? Um, in the end, what I realized was she did exactly what she wanted. Her life was about family. She spent time with my brothers and my sister and she, nine nieces and nephews, you know, grandchildren, great grandchildren. She spent time with my stepdad. That's what she wanted. So, would I give anything to have her back? Of course but not if I had to lose the lessons 
that I learned going back through her life and reading the book in the end, reading, writing the book. Writing the book. Yeah. The process of writing itself just takes you to so many places. Um, Such a striking story. And so let's jump forward again. So you've got this string of events that are leading you to this curb where you're just like, you got nowhere to go. Um, If there was ever a rock bottom point with a succession of bits of bad luck, one might say in inverted commas, um, what did that feel like? Where did that take you? Oh, it was the worst experience of my life. I mean, I had never been, you know, I had never, they were basically firing me, sure. but they asked me to write a resignation letter. And to this day, nobody knows that this guy actually let me go. There's one person that knows, two people that know of the whole organization. And I'm not going to say who it is because it's a very prominent international group. Sure. And I looked at him and I said, I've never been asked to resign from a job. Are you kidding? He's like, no. So it really, for me, was rock bottom. Like I was questioning myself, doubting myself. Yeah. Thankfully, I had this beautiful friend who let me and my cat move into her third floor uh, for about eight months while I got myself back on my feet. I had some savings. I re- and, I, and that's when I wrote my book. That was my first iteration of my book because I realized I was not myself at this job. I was grieving. I was 20 pounds overweight. I, all my close-knit group of girlfriends were back in Colorado I had friends in DC from when I used to live here the first time, but I hadn't stayed tight with them. And so I would wake up at five o'clock in the morning to write with a writing partner who was living in Europe at the time. And I would write for at least an hour and I would cry and I would sob and I would do all the things to just get all the grief out of me because your body has so much cellular memory about everything. And then I found myself not just writing about my, my experience with my mom's cancer, but all the events in my life that led up to those moments of resilience. Yeah, the moment where my very first campaign, I was someplace I didn't know, driving in my car and accidentally ran a red stoplight because I didn't see it. I was looking for where I was going and T-boned a car and totaled my car uh, her car went into a pole, hurt, she hurt her back. I didn't have insurance to cover my car because I had just gotten the car and only had liability. So I was without a vehicle. I couldn't perform on my job because I didn't have a, a vehicle. I wound up, uh, I went to the junkyard to see it with a friend of mine who lived close by and the car was totaled. Like he was surprised I was walking. The, me and the two people in the car walked away not hurt. And he was like, you know, he was like out of a a movie. He was like, girl, you're walking. You don't even got a cast on. This is Southern Ohio. So they sound a little, but he owned a junkyard and he had a car that I could buy, but I couldn't afford it. So I worked in his junkyard in the mornings, pulling parts off of vehicles and selling parts to these big strapping guys that would, they're like, who's this girl? Like looking at my boobs and looking me up and down. I'm like, what do you need? Well, I need this from this. Okay. And I grab a crowbar and I go out to the lot. And I would hear my, my bosses, girl, that's a cat, you know, that's a Chrysler. That's not a Dodge. Look at the headlights. Tra- you know, and, I, and at like 9 a.m., I'd head back to where I was staying, blow the grease out of my nose, get changed, and then get on the campaign trail. But you talk about resilience. Wow. When I left there, I had no money to put gas on my car. This guy would feed me breakfast every morning because he knew I was, I was working for free on the campaign, you know, so I was working off everything. He'd feed me breakfast. He put $20 in my pocket to get gas. And it was years later, I sent that $20 back to him and his family to say thank you that I remembered him. And I never heard a reply, but it made me feel good that they would remember what a kindness he did for me at that time. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so you've just got to hustle, but there is something about being in that survival point, right? Like you almost don't have a choice. You've got to go for any opportunity, anything to just survive in some way and inadvertently, you're dealing with your grief, you're building resilience, you're, you're processing things kind of in action. Yeah. Were, you su- were you surprised about the grief process at all? Or because you had like the three to five years or whatever, you didn't know how long your mom was going to be with you. Did you try and like get ahead of the game or uh, everyone's different, right? But there are these kind of stages and people still have lots to say about grief. Were you surprised about any of it? Um, was I surprised? I, um, I don't know if surprise is the right word, but I don't know what other word I would use. Here's the interesting thing. When my mom passed away, I had a dear friend whose mom passed away two weeks earlier. Her mom dropped dead of a heart attack. And I didn't know. I was, I was coming back from the funeral on the plane. 
and was scrolling through my Facebook feed and saw her post and immediately called her and we both burst into tears and we were having, and she came over for dinner and we're having this surreal, like, well, is it better if somebody lingers or is it yeah. better if somebody drops dead? Like what? N neither one is better. But then the thing that really did strike me, Petra, was that Elizabeth Kubler-Ross on death and die, dying on grief and grieving is sort of the hallmark literature yeah. on that grief process and putting a name to it. I think people will be surprised to understand grief is not linear. Grief is holographic. It will sucker punch you from every angle. And I always tell people there's the firsts because first of all, once somebody dies, there's all the dealing with if they died suddenly or they lingered, all the the process of the funeral and the people Believe that are me. around you. Yeah. And the people calling you and supporting you. And then all of a sudden you're left on your own to be alone with your thoughts. And then there's that piece of it. Oh, and then there's your first birthday, their first birthday, wedding anniversaries. You're walking and a song comes on that reminds you of them. You know, I was walking yesterday. I went out, um, to get some groceries. And I actually, because my, one of the grocers down the street has a Starbucks and I thought to myself, I need a moment of normalcy. And I went and got a peppermint mocha and just sat on this park bench. I, I had a mask on. I had gloves on when I walked in, got my mocha, sat on a park bench and just sat and drank my Starbucks coffee for a single moment of normalcy. And as I was walking home, I'm like, when are things going to get right? And I look up in the tree and there's a red cardinal, this fat red cardinal that's just sitting there looking at me. And my stepdad, who's passed, always comes to me as a cardinal. And, it, and I felt like that was the moment of him to say, it's going to be okay, kiddo. Don't worry. You can't be so worried. That's what he used to say to me. You can't manage everything. You can't do everything. You can't worry about everything. It's going to be okay. And I felt like that was his moment. And we just stared at each other for what felt like forever. And I looked away for a moment. I looked back and it was gone. N nowhere to be found. So I think from that, from that perspective, I guess that would be the most surprising is that there is, a, it's a sucker punch. It's not something to get through. And it took me years to not be hit in the face by grief at moments that surprised me. And it still happens from time to time. I will, you know, come across something or see something on TV and it will remind me of my mom. Of course. Or my stepdad or my grandmother or whoever else, a friend who's passed, you know. And I, but I guess through this process of the, the book and, and finding purpose within, you know, the, the pain of it and finding the gifts within it, it ends up or it's ended up being a sort of fuel, it seems, to create impact and to support other people in some way. Um, absolutely. Yeah. No, yeah, absolutely. And I think because... I will never ask somebody, and I'm sure you're the same way, to deal with something or do something that I haven't done. Right. And, and I also think being willing, as I say, to grab those snarling dogs by the ears and look them dead in the eye and tell them to go away gives you the um, confidence to be able to uh, um, um, be authentic and be heart-wrenchingly vulnerable and tell stories on yourself that other people might be too afraid to tell because it wouldn't make them look good. I don't care. Like I, I think I mentioned uh, to you before we, we started on the, on the podcast that every day I've been doing uh, Facebook Live, 10 minutes, you know, or maybe I'm, I i do not know. I feel like we've been talking for weeks, which is yeah. awesome. <laughs> but, you know, I've come on with no makeup. I've come on like just having crawled out of bed in my pajamas. I don't care. Like I want to be there for you and I'm going to come on the same day every day to answer questions, to interact with you, to say hello now and forever, because this, I feel like this is part of my contribution to the world. Um, so I think that answers your question. I just yeah, got yeah, lost yeah. in a little train of thought. Yeah, of course. But that's, that just highlights that grief isn't linear and the story around it can't be linear, right? There's so many, right. so many, so many impacts. Um, so you start writing your book and we'll have to fast forward a little bit, but I'm always curious because I'm seeing like almost the finished product. We're never the finished product, but you know what I mean? You're, you're successful, you're speaking, you're advising, you're doing all these sorts of things you're fulfilled and, you know, um, and you have wisdom to, to offer to the world. That was a long list, but I feel like it's all true. Um, and so you're able to do that, but from writing the book, I personally know that there's often a messy middle of like moving into that. Right. I mean, what were some of the top challenges, I guess, from that point of total despair to going, Ooh, maybe I'll write the book to kind of becoming the person that you are now. Well, I think uh, number one, I went through seven rewrites 
in four years. That's really good to know. <laughs> Seven rewrites. Just like a ooh, magical publisher picks it up and it's all wonderful. Yeah. No, 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 no. And I had a writing coach and it was really my writing coach and another mentor who I said to her, if you had to describe seeing me through this process, she said, well, honey, you grab those snarling dogs by the ears and you wouldn't let go. And, that, and that's where I got that from. So these two wonderful women I had a, the biggest challenge was I had a crisis of confidence. Do I really have anything to say? Am I a good writer? So I, maybe it was just, maybe I just wrote it for me. Maybe it was part of my grief process. And if my family reads it, great. And both of them said, no, this has to be out in the world. And so my writing coach wound up being an agent who then wound up bringing me to my publisher. And I used what's known as a hybrid publisher. So I paid them to do the layout um, of the book to get it up on Kindle. And then it was up to me. And by the way, for anyone that wants to write a book and either wants a publisher or self-publishing, you still have to do all the marketing. Unless you're some big name that's already sure. out there, you've got to do the marketing yourself. That's kind of a misnomer. And the, writing the book is the easy part. It's the marketing and getting it out there, right? Which is the more difficult part. So anyway, so I did such a good job of getting it out there. It became an Amazon bestseller the company also has their regular publishing arm where they have salespeople go out to brick and mortar bookstores to present yeah. new titles. Yeah. They said, wow, you've done such a great job. Can we do a re-release and we're going to take you under our wing? So that's what happened in 2017. But going back to this, I, the book was published in 2016. I had a full-time job. I was working for a solar company, lobbying municipalities on their behalf with a team of 12 that I had built. I wasn't planning to go anywhere. You know, and I was going to publish the book. I'd hired a, hired a publicist and then bam, I was laid off the day before the book came out. So you were laid off again or was this the time? This was the fourth time. This is the fourth time. Yeah, yeah. Because in, you, in you four got years. laid off and started the book and now you got laid off right before it was published. Exactly. And that was actually, I had been laid off twice in the writing, pro like three times between starting writing the book and finishing so here's three a, times. Here's like a different angle question. What meaning? And that's a you, three, by the way. That's a three. I just realized. Go ooh, ahead. Ooh. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, what meaning do you give that incident now? So that chain of events. So the being. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Well, I, I sat and pondered it because I had a friend's. I have so many great friends. I had a friend's hus husband reach out to me and go. So what are you doing now that you're laid off? I'm like, well, you know, different people from the company are talking to me and I'm trying to figure out, I'm probably going to start looking for jobs. And he goes, what are you doing? And whatever else he said to me within a week, I went, you're right. I've got a bigger message here. I always have said, I'm, I'm very stubborn and thick headed. And I jokingly have always said, God, you've got to hit me over the head by, with a two by four until my ex-husband said, honey, can you please not say that? Because one day you're going to have one in through your windshield. So please stop saying that. So I just you know, give me a big sign. And Stephen, my friend said to me, that is your big sign. So I chose to go into business for myself and then it was okay. Let me get the book out there because it, ovarian cancer awareness month is September. So through that piece, I got on Amazon bestseller list. I did a bunch of radio TV kind of finished that whole thing. And then come October, November, I'm thinking I got to make money. One of my mentors said that to me. I'm like, all right, well, I'll start coaching people full time. And then I began coaching people full time. But this is my fourth year in my business. And it's taken me, I mean, I've been through a lot of ups and downs, as you can well imagine. Who's your ideal client? What do you have to offer? What, who am I separate from the work I was doing for Landmark? Because I completed with them in 2015. So what's my voice? And how do I say what I want to say? Because I had been so trained in a particular, sure. uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, particular style, yeah. you know, then what's my style and what do I have to say and how do I contribute back to the world? So I feel like now for the first time, I'm really in my groove of knowing who I am going into the fourth year, January, February were my best months and then bam, COVID-19 hits. <laughs> yes. Right. And so, you know, I'm now rethinking everything and uh, so, how do I that's so fresh right so the COVID-19 thing um but you've had such a string of adversities challenges difficulties that have happened that you now it's always easier in hindsight to see the meaning right and to go oh that was the opportunity knocking me on the head but this is we're quite in this right yeah. but do you feel that your history of facing adversity and learning to deal and perspective and all that has um positively impacted how you can kind of face up to COVID-19 and maybe the impact on yourself or people around you? 
Absolutely, without a doubt, because you know, literally over the course, because I keep, you know, I have I, whatever people's faith is. I have a faith in. I call her God or goddess. People can call it Buddha, Allah, or they might believe in their doorknob. It doesn't matter to me. Sure. But I always, I have, I have a post note on my computer that says, show me where to go, show me who to talk to, show me what to ask. And it has caused me to go, I have 16 hours of online content. How do I repurpose that, repackage it, market it? I've been resisting because I'm really, I love being like this with people coaching them because my coaching business has been remote and virtual via Zoom anyway. the whole time. So sure. that's normal. I've been leading webinars. That's normal. So do I repackage that evergreen content and have that? Do I, uh, how do I get my YouTube channel up and going? I've been reorganizing my website. Some of the speaking gigs I had are now virtual. So we're going to do tomorrow. I have an hour long on time management and we're going to do another one in May on effective goal setting. So I'm like, all right, well, let me reach out to people. How about doing one on resilience during this time of anxiety? Would your workers, would that be of interest to you? Great. Let me charge you a much smaller amount than I would to fly in and be your keynote speaker so that I can contribute to you. So it definitely has caused me to pivot really quickly and rethink things in a, in a way that I, and that's so good that you asked that because I'm only realizing it as I'm saying it to you. Yes. I think I've pivoted and become more resilient much quicker than other people have. Number one, who aren't used to working virtually. Yeah. I've, worked, I've worked by myself forever. And number two, uh, are maybe stuck in, well, let's just wait and see rather yeah. than using this time to their advantage. Finding that opportunity, absolutely. Um, yeah. So we're just about at our time. Before no. I, ask, I know <laughs> we could do this for hours. I feel like we should get you on again and just do like an expert chat on something and go deep and on can, something. Yes, absolutely. Over some tea or something like that, or maybe That's we'll just, do a lunch hour and be eating our gruel or whatever. Well, we're I eating. think people would be all over that now. <laughs> we're just trying, you know, want connection. Um, yeah. So before I ask my final question, where can people find you? So where's the book? Like your website? Like speaking? Yeah. How can they connect? Easy, easy peasy. So my website is jencoken.com, J-E-N-C-O-K-E-N.com. That's my handle on Facebook, on Instagram, on YouTube. If you, ha if you do hashtag coffee with Jen, you'll find the snippets that I'm putting up every cool. day along with some other content. And I'm, I'm trying to now, all the other content that I have of videos, uploading it there. They can email me at jen at jencoken. Dot com and I think Twitter is Jay Koken, not Jen Koken. That's the only one that's that's different. I try to be consistent. Yeah, you've got a good surname for that. It's doesn't, Thank you. It won't be too repeated. Um, we'll add all of that into the show notes so people can uh, look there and connect Thank with you as so they should. Um, and finally, what advice would you give? Maybe top one to three things. What advice would you give to somebody who is in their rock bottom moment now? So fill in the blanks. It could be a grief such as you've experienced loss of work or, or just maybe it's feeling the anxiety right now and thinking, what if I lose my house? And, you know, not to mention the, the health issues. So whatever the, the blanks that, that we might fill for that individual, but taken from your own experience of like your own, you know, cause when we're in a rock bottom moment, it feels like there's no hope. No one sees us. We're fucked. This is it. And there's no way out. That's yeah. what it feels like. And you can yeah, fill in more blanks, yeah, yeah. right? So from, from your own learning, what's the top maybe three things that, you know, the, the first step somebody might take to move their life to inch forward? Yeah. Number one, don't numb yourself. No wine. Stay awake, cake. stay present. Yeah, stay awake, stay present. Don't numb yourself. By being on your laptop or talking to people, you've got to be, and number two, feel your feelings. The only way to wonderland, Alice, is through the looking glass. You've got to be willing to sit with all the feelings, the grief, the sadness, and use emotional release techniques to move that energy through your body because your cells have memory. And if you don't, it will create dis-ease in your body. Emotional release, you know, I've got something called a damn it doll that someone gave me in my divorce that says, when you're mad, don't say damn it, take this doll and just slam it. So yeah. I like beat my chair with it, you know, yeah. anything that involves breath, sound, and movement. Third thing is ask for help. You know that if your friend was as down as you are or upset or challenged, you would feel horrible if they didn't reach out because you would want to at least be an ear. Why don't you think the same of other people? You know, make sure that you reach out to them. My blog this week was just about that. I said, you know, unicorns don't always fart pixie dust. 
you know, sometimes crap happens. So reach out to your friends, reach out to your tribe. And if they're not there for you, then they're not your tribe. Fuck them. Get a new tribe. That's fair. And reach out to people who are offering content and, and creating tribes these days online uh, where you can have that space to, to talk and get the support that you need. Uh, Jen, thank you so much for your time. Uh, I'm so glad we caught you during this remote working time, but it sounds like you're the queen at that already. Um, we'll put the show, we'll put the, your book title. That sounds so exciting. I'll, I'll be looking out for that one myself and hopefully we'll get you on again soon. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you.